Thank you very much, Dr. Archer, and thank you all very much for being here. Um, firstly, I would like to thank Angelo State University and the Dr. Arnaldo de Leon Department of History for putting this event on. And I'd especially like to once again thank Dr. Archer, who made the poster for this talk, which I think is just marvelous. <laughs> Um, often when we think about ancient history, we think of, of events that have been settled thoroughly for hundreds of years. This makes sense. The study of Greek history is the oldest field of history in the Western world. Our earliest histories are ancient Greeks, writing about even more ancient Greeks. Um, People have been studying the ancient Greeks basically for as long as there, have been, there has been studying. Um, however, what I hope to do tonight is, at least in part, to suggest that the ancient Greek world and ancient Greek history isn't a settled narrative, but it's full of, it is full of exciting, uh, dynamic possibilities. The field of ancient history can be a secret history, where the unexpressed and unmentioned can be brought to light. Uh, my goal for this talk is to excavate the lost voices of the ancient world, to find the stories of a people who have largely been marginalized in the chronicle of ancient Greece. I hope to recontextualize and deepen the traditional narratives and offer a new perspective on the social and political dynamics of the fifth century. In the late spring or early summer of 457 BCE, an army of Athenians supported by contingents of allied Argive and Thessalian soldiers uh, intercepted a Spartan army near the town of Tanagra in the plains of western Boeotia. Uh, in this battle, a Thessalian soldier named Theotimos was killed. We do not know what became of the body, but a gravestone called a stele was erected by his family at the, his hometown of Atrax in central Thessaly. This is what remains of the gravestone. It is currently housed in the Diachronic Museum in Larissa, Greece. Uh, at first glance, the artifact is a fine piece, but it's not substantially different from other gravestones which can be found in the Greek world. However, I believe Theotimos' stele does in fact tell a story which has greater implications for our understanding of the Salian history and interstate dynamics in fifth century Greece. But before I get into what Theotimos' gravestone might mean, I really need to discuss Theotimos' people and country, the ancient Greek region known as Thessaly. So to give us some starting geographical context, this is a map of the Hellenic Peninsula with the general area of Thessaly highlighted. Um, this is the modern, modern administrative region. Uh, ancient Thessaly uh, was geographically a little bit more limited. And this is a map of ancient Thessaly. We'll get into some of these place names shortly. So Thessaly is unfortunately understudied in the area of Greek history. No ancient literature by Thessalian authors has survived. And the vast majority of modern archaeology has been focused on the city of Athens. This is understandable because we have significant literary data about Athens and its environs. Athenian artifacts can be easily contextualized and fit into the historical narrative. When we get artifacts from Thessaly, uh, they generally remain mysterious and modern scholarship can only guess at their origins and uses. All information we get about the Thessalian people comes from non-Thessalian sources. And as a result, we tend to get a skewed, mostly stereotypical picture of the people of Thessaly. In antiquity, Thessaly was comprised of two plains encircled by mountain ranges. The western upper plain, the Tricola Cardiza Basin, and the eastern lower plain, the Larissa Corolla Basin. These two vast depressions are divided by a low-lying range of hills running from the northeast to the southwest, um, sorry, northwest to the southeast, ranging in height from between 200 and 600 meters tall. The two plains encompass an area of roughly 4,000 square kilometers, making Thessaly 
when it was unified, one of the largest political units in ancient Greece. In the ancient world, Thessaly was often seen as a land of extremes, and its geography reflects this perception. The upper and lower plains of Thessaly form the greater part of the Peneos River Basin, which has defined the Thessalian landscape for at least three millennia. The Peneos isn't the largest river in Greece, but its tributary system is one of the most extensive. This preponderance of waterways it could cause issues with drainage. From November to April, flooding seems to have been a constant threat, especially in the Upper Plain. From May to October, the Pineos River and its tributaries may be entirely waterless. Modern farmers and ranchers must rely on dammed areas and depressions form, or ponds formed in depressions near the river or its tributaries. It's likely this was also an ancient practice. The tendency towards flooding in these mild winter months could make agriculture in Thessaly a dicey proposition. While Thessaly was still regarded as some of the best agricultural land in Greece, extant sources suggest that the raising and herding of livestock was the primary industry. In the summer, the heat, combined with a lack of water in the lowlands, encouraged pastoralism and a limited transhumance with animals grazing in the plains during the cooler winter months and being driven into the mountains during the dry period of the summers. The Greek world was aware of the quality of Thessalian animals, especially the horses, and the trade in these animals was highly lucrative. Alexander the Great's horse Bucephalus was Thessalian, named for the Bucephalus or Oxhead brand on horses raised in the city of Pharsalus. It's a little bit like naming your car Ford. Um, <laughs> records kept by Athenian cavalrymen suggest that Thessalian horses were a luxury item. The value of mounts branded with the double axe of Ferre or the centaur of Larissa were two or three times greater than the local Athenian breeds. The very early history of the Thessalians is unknown. However, by the fifth century, uh, they believed themselves to be a migratory people who were not native to the Peneos River Basin. Thucydides recorded that the Thessalians arrived in Thessaly 60 years after the fall of Troy. Herodotus understood that the Thessalians had come from Thesprotia in Epirus in northwestern Greece. This is corroborated by the fact that the Thessalians spoke an Aeolic dialect of Greek rather than the older Arcadian, Doric, or Ionic dialects spoken by the majority of the Greek world. And you can see on our map here, the yellow is the uh, Aeolic dialect areas. You really only get it in Thessaly and Boeotia and a little bit of uh, the Turkish coast. Um, everywhere else is the much older Doric, Aeolic, or Ionic dialects. Uh, the Thessalians were fully Greek, and also they perceived themselves as being distinct from other Greeks. This is a red figure drinking cup with a Thessalian cavalryman wearing the traditional broad-brimmed felt patassos hat. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, we have no extant writing from Thessalian authors, only outsiders writing about them. So... As such, we must take descriptions of the Thessalians with perhaps more than a grain of salt. Ancient Greeks loved stereotypes far more than any notion of historical accuracy. According to outsiders, the Thessalians were rich, shiftless, uncultured, and greedy. They were prone to factionalism and infighting. The vulgar richness of Thessalians was the butt of jokes for Athenian com comedy writers who evoked images of Thessalian aristocrats eating at tables piled high with meat and drinking enormous quantities of wine. The richness of Thessaly made, uh, made it a land where social boundaries and borders were blurred or non-existent. The penestai, the unfree class in Thessaly, 
were so wealthy that other Greeks complained they could mistake them for free citizens. When Athenian philosopher Socrates, on death row for corrupting the youth of Athens, when he was offered a chance to flee to safe haven in Thessaly, he rejected it outright. What will I do except feast in Thessaly, he said, as if I was there for a banquet. It was better to drink poison as a respectable city in Athens than wine as an indolent gourmand in Thessaly. Thessalian coins are, are minted fairly late in the Greek world. Specie from Thessalian mints only begins appearing in the fifth century. On Thessalian coins, we tend to find horses and bulls, images of barley and wheat, Thessalian heroes such as Jason of the Argonauts fame, and local aspects of the Athenian pan or sorry, the Olympian pantheon, such as the war goddess, Athena Itonia. While many cities had their own mints for their own coinage, we do find pan-Thessalian coinage, such as the coin on our uh, right here, which uh, historians and numismatists believe were made to represent the uh, Thessalian federal government. The philosopher Aristotle wrote treatises on the constitutions of a number of Greek polities, including Thessaly, but only his work on the government of Athens has survived. What modern scholarship knows about the structure and function of Thessalian government is limited. Much of our reconstruction is based on educated guesswork and inference. By the fifth century, the Greeks understood that Thessaly was a federal state divided into four administrative regions called tetrads. Euripides' play Alcestis, and I have the passage here on our left, set in Thessaly, clearly identified the political institution of the tetrads. Ancient Greek drama was set in the idealized past and for an Athenian writer to include the tetrad system indicates that the Greeks understood the tetrads to have been part of Thessalian governance for generations. While it's chronologically late, we also have direct attestation from a Thessalian source confirming the existence of this system. In the 330s, a man named Deochus thought to be the, a partisan of the Macedonian king Philip II, the father of Alexander the Great, erected statues of himself and his ancestors at Delphi. You can still see the remnants of the statues here on our left. Now Delphi was arguably the most important religious site in the ancient Greek world. In the line of ancestors that uh, Deochus chose to memorialize, his earliest ancestor, Acnonios, is identified as having been a tetrarch, a, a ruler of one of these tetrads of Thessaly, and he held this position sometime in the 490s. Now, until 431 BC, in the literary record, whenever Thessalian armies leave Thessaly, they are collectively described as the Thessalians, rather than originating in a particular city or tetrad, which leads e uh, historians to believe that each city within Thessaly was responsible for its own civil administrative matters. The tetrads which composed the Thessalian federal government were institutions for what we might think of as foreign policy, primarily Thessalian military expeditions outside of the region. And according to ancient attestation, the four tetrads of Thessaly were Thessaliotis, Pelasgiotis, Pythiotis, and over in the uh, north, Hestasiotis. So who were the elites who ruled the tetrads of Thessaly? Modern historians have generally accepted that Thessalian society was dominated politically and likely socially by aristocratic kinship groups, often referred to as clans. Thanks to uh, extant evidence like Theocritus's idols 
a passage which is on our screen here, written in the fourth century, we know of a number of clans and their urban centers of power. The Creonidae of Cranon, the Scopidae, the Aluade of Larissa, and the Echocratidae of Pharsalus. The fortunes of these great aristocratic clans seem to have largely been based on animal wealth. Massive herds of cattle and sheep were common and tended to by the Penestae, the unfree class in Thessaly, often likened by ancient authors to the helots of Sparta. Modern uh, historians believe that the Aluade, the ancestors of the semi-mythical King Aluas, were the politically dominant Thessalian clan through most of the classical period. This was at least in part thanks to their connections with the Argead dynasty of Macedonia and the position of Larissa as a key stop on the north-south overland trade routes between Greece and the Balkans. So I want to point us to one item here. In Theocritus' idol, he identifies King Aluas of Thessaly. So I want to take a brief moment and for some political and language terminology. Like any language, the meaning of words in ancient Greece changes over time, and words have flexible meanings. When the Greeks described the great king of Persia, an autocratic ruler with a divine mandate, they used the term basileus. When the Greeks described the Spartan kings, who were elected by a council and constrained by a constitution, they used the term basileus. When Greeks described the member of the elected government of Athens, who was in charge of public worship, they used the term basileus. The term king or basileus can be a specific formal term, but also a description of a person's political and social power. Non-Thessalian authors tend to identify the Thessalian basileus, or basileis in plural, and in this context, Thessalian kings were probably powerful aristocrats and war leaders, probably constrained by cultural traditions and the social power of their elite contemporaries and competitors. Extant evidence suggests that the Thessalians referred to their leader as an archon, a fairly common term throughout the Greek world for chief magistrate or government. It means very vaguely, basically, to be first. Right, is the Archon. And so it's best to think of the Thessalian kings, uh, we'll have a couple of instances of kings in the literary record up on our screen, as an elected warlord rather than a hereditary autocratic ruler. So the first verifiable entry of the Thessalians into the world of Greek interstate politics though I would love uh, to talk about the mytho-historic First Sacred War another time, comes in 511 BCE. So back in 546, Athenian tyrant Pisistratus took power for a second time in Athens. According to Herodotus, he did so by driving a chariot through the city accompanied by a woman dressed up as Athena, convincing the credulous Athenians that he had divine backing for his power grab. But by 511 BCE, Pisistratus' son and successor, Hippias, was in an unstable political position, threatened by a restive Athenian population and menaced by a Spartan army intent on liberating Athens. The Thessalian Basileus, Sinius, led an expedition of Thessalian cavalry to support Athens. Sinius and the Thessalian horsemen were able to drive off the Spartan hoplites. And from this period on, the Thessalians seem to have been politically aligned with Athens. Now, it's important to note that this relationship does not appear to have been ideological. The Thessalians supported Athenian autocracy as well as Athenian democracy. So the historical record of ancient Greece is spotty and filled with omissions. Ancient accounts convey that sometime in the late 6th or early 5th centuries, the people of Phocis fought a series of night battles with the Thessalians. Phocian victories in this conflict 
ended Thessalian hegemonic domination over focus in central Greece. Now you might be asking yourself, when did this hegemonic project begin? Or why were the Thessalians intent on making focus a tributary state? Or how did this political domination function? The answer to these very reasonable questions is, we have no idea. <laughs> None of the extant evidence gives any information as to the shape or form of the Thessalian imperial project in central Greece. But whatever the character and duration of Thessalian imperialism, the conquest of Phocis and the subsequent Phocian rebellion against the Thessalians had a significant impact on the political dynamics of Thessaly, Phocis, and central Greece. The end of the Thessalian imperial project weakened the political dominance of the Iluad clan in Thessaly, pushing them to look for external allies to shore up their internal political position. The blow to Iluad prestige also disrupted elite consensus in Thessaly, creating an opportunity for Thessalians unhappy with the rule of the Aluade to envision a new political and social distribution of power. From this point forward, political legitimacy in Thessaly rested on the ability of those in power to punish the Phocians for the temerity to resist imperial domination. On the part of the Phocians, undermining Thessalian policy and damaging Thessalian presti prestige was a consistent political priority. The Greeks were not the only power in the Mediterranean. Established in 550, the Persian Empire stretched from Pakistan to Turkey, Egypt to Uzbekistan. In 480 BCE, after years of Athenian attempts to undermine Persian control of Greek cities on the coast of what is today Turkey, the Persian Emperor Xerxes launched an expedition to conquer Greece and end what were essentially terrorist attacks on his western frontiers. While some in Greece saw this as the end of the world and the end of Greek liberty, though you might ask a Greek woman about the much vaunted freedom of the Greeks, the Thessalians saw the entry of the Persians into mainland Greek affairs as an opportunity to reassert their power over central Greece. A secret alliance between the Persians and the Thessalians was orchestrated by the Iluad clan in Larissa. However, the, in this episode, we see the cracks in the ruling consensus of the Thessalian elite. When the plans of the Aluadi were discovered, a dissident group of Thessalians, though we unfortunately don't know who, sent an embassy to the Southern Greeks who were preparing to resist the Persian invasion. They managed to convince the Athenians and Spartans to send a massive army to meet the Persians at the Vale of Tempe, a river valley conveniently located only a few miles from the Aluad city of Larissa. The Athenians and Spartan army arrived in Thessaly, but after only a few days, the expedition leaders lost their nerve and the army fled southward, allowing the Aluade to dictate Thessalian policy. Upon the arrival of the Persian army in Thessaly, the Aluade sent messengers to the Phocians, demanding a massive bribe in exchange for not leading the Persians through Phocian territory. The Phocians, who at this point had aligned themselves with the anti-Persian faction of Greeks, not for any ideological reasons, but purely because the Thessalians had chosen to ally with the Persians, rejected the Thessalian threat. And so the Thessalian guides led the Persian army through the Cephissos River Valley, the heartland of Phocian territory. The route they took roughly is highlighted here. Herodotus recorded that the Thessalians and their Persian allies specifically targeted Phocian religious sites. In the ancient Greek world, worship at temples and shrines to locally important gods was the institution through which people created a common unified identity, 
a process often called ethnogenesis. In destroying Phokian religious sites, the Thessalians were attempting to unmake the Phokians as a people. While the Persian invasion ended in failure, the betrayal of the Thessalians was not forgotten by the Greeks who resisted. In 478, two years after the Persian invasion, a Spartan army under the command of King Leotychidas marched into Thessaly to subdue the region and punish it for allying with the Persians. The target of Spartan reprisal was the Aluade, the dynastic Thessalian family that had architected the alliance with the invading Persians. The expedition ended in failure. Leo Tychidas was accused of taking Thessalian bribes and recalled back to Sparta. But the Spartans were able to unseat two Aluad aristocrats, Aristomedes and Angelus. And by 464, the Thessalians, under the weakened Aluadi, had reestablished formal connections with the now democratic Athenian state in an explicitly anti-Spartan treaty. In 460, relations deteriorated between the Athenians and the Spartans sufficiently that they went to war. This was the first Peloponnesian War, uh, the one that Thucydides writes maybe 15 pages about, uh, unfortunately. So in 457, the uh, Athenian allied Phokians invaded Doris. Doris was a backwater, small and undeveloped in the mountains of central Greece. Kind of got a little red arrow there showing the, well, the area we're looking at. Doris was a backwater, but in the ancient world, it was believed to have been the ancestral homeland of the Spartans and its people, their kin. Regardless of the limited strategic or economic importance of Doris, its status as the metropolis of Sparta necessitated a bold reaction. The Spartans sent a massive army under the command of General Nicomedes to eject the Phokians and restore Dorian independence. The Spartan army was successful in ending this Phokian expansion, this Phokian power grab, but the path home to the Peloponnese required traveling along the border of Athenian territory. Sensing an opportunity to strike a blow against Spartan power and support the Phokians, now firmly in the anti-Spartan camp, the Athenian Demos mustered its army, summoned their Thessalian and Argive allies, in total about 14,000 soldiers, and intercepted the homeward bound Spartan army on the plains of Boeotia near the town of Tanagra. It's highlighted right there on our map. This is a modern picture of Tanagra to give folks a sense of the terrain. The battle seems to have been a bloody affair without an obvious victor. While our extant ancient accounts do not fully agree on the results of the conflict, all highlight that at some point in the battle, the Thessalians abandoned their Athenian allies and sided with the Spartans, either preventing an Athenian victory or ensuring a Spartan one. Accounts differ. Moreover, the Thessalians reinforced their duplicity with a devastating night raid on the Athenian supply train, brutally cutting down Athenians who were ignorant of the Thessalian betrayal. It's difficult to understand Thessalian actions. Up to this point in their recorded history, the Thessalians were firmly in the Athenian camp. Seven years earlier, in 464, the Thessalians signed a formal alliance with the Athenians with the specific purpose of supporting Athenian attempts to counter Spartan power. The Thessalian elite were socially connected to their Athenian counterparts. Moreover, the Athenian and Spartan armies continued skirmishing in Boeotia for months, and the Thessalians appear to have abandoned the endeavor. So what happened? Why such a remarkable about face on the part of the Thessalians and their Athenian allies? And if they were instrumental in determining the course of the Battle of Tanagra, why did they not continue to exploit their success for further gain? 
to find the answers to these questions, we return back to our fallen Thessalian soldier, Theotimos. So in 1977, a stele was found buried near the site of ancient Atrax, a Thessalian city near Larissa. The stele is a white marble slab, roughly five feet tall, two feet wide, and eight inches thick. Uh, it appears that it was reused as building material in both the Hellenistic and Roman periods. On our left here, you can see it. It portrays a Greek soldier holding a spear and a hoplon, the traditional Greek heavy shield. I think it's a really well-made piece, and it's made all the more interesting by the inscription to the deceased on the top of the stele. You can see uh, the inscription here and here, um, if, if you're close enough to the screen. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the Diachronic Museum in Larissa does not offer very good photographs of the inscription itself, so you'll just have to trust me that this is what it says. Mm -hmm. The inscription, written in the Thessalian Aeolic dialect, is translated as follows. And for those of you who want, I have the Greek up top. Here he lies in no way dishonoring the glory of the city of Atrax of the wide places, procuring a crown for Thessaly. O Theotimos, son of Menelos, with the noblest men among the Hellenes in the plain of Tanagra. So Theotimos's epitaph is unusual for the ancient Greek world. When individuals are commemorated as having fallen in battle on personal barrier markers, their epitaphs are largely formal and the language generic. Rarely do personal circumstances or details regarding the cause of death appear. The fact that Theotimos's epitaph notes he died on the field at Tanagra is an unusual detail for monuments of this type and suggests that there was significant cultural importance for displaying his participation in the conflict to the local community. Moreover, Theotimos's death was not just commemorated, it was monumentalized. While his gravestone was intended for a Thessalian audience, there is a distinct universalizing tone in his epitaph. Theotimos was one of many Greeks at Tanagra, and his martial glory was not applicable just to Atrax, the town he was from, but to all of Thessaly itself. Moreover, the phrase Stephanon Teuchon, to procure a crown, is the same language used to describe victors in the Pan-Hellenic Olympic Games. The glory of Theotimos' death on the battlefield transcended military glory and military victory and entered into athletic and religious spheres. His death touched all aspects of civilized life. Anxiety about Theotimos's treachery might necessitate justifying the betrayal in his epitaph. There is none. Nor is there any attempt to obscure Theotimos's participation in a battle which was quite well known in the ancient world. The heroizing elements of the inscription elevated the death of Theotimos and his participation in the betrayal of an ally into a mytho-historic action a conflict undertaken on behalf of all Thessalians. This strategy points to a desire to shift the focus of Theotimos's actions away from the death of the individual and portray Theotimos, uh, his actions and death as, as, and, as sorry, um, and portray Theotimos as a whole, as the, and Thessaly as a whole, as the beneficiary of the actions of Theotimos and his compatriots. The betrayal of the Athenians is not mentioned, not because there's an attempt to hide it, but because for Theotimos's relatives, there was nothing to hide. Taken by itself, the Theotimos stele is an interesting curio, but when examined in context with other pieces of material evidence and literary evidence, a new possibility for Thessalian politics in the fifth century begins to emerge. So in 1957, 
during the construction of a home near Delphi, a broken limestone block of classical era provenance was discovered, roughly three feet wide, a foot and a half deep, and a foot high. The block had two post holes, which you can see here, um, to anchor the statue of a horse, which has unfortunately gone missing. Carved into the face of the monument is a dedication which was published by Georges Dow in 1958. The full, trans uh, full inscription is lost, but uh, the transcription of the remaining text looks like this. Following Dow, this is my translation for the inscription. The Thessalians gave the horse, the statue, and a tenth of the spoils from Tanagra at Apollo, when these were the Polemarchs. And these were these folks, these seven or eight folks, were the uh, Polemarchs at Tanagra. While this inscription lasts the heroizing verbiage of Theotimos's gravestone, what is particularly interesting about this monument was its placement at Delphi, one of the most important religious sites in mainland Greece. Whereas Theotimos's grave marker was meant for a Thessalian audience, this monument would have been visible to the thousands who visited Delphi every year. It was designed with a wider Greek audience in mind. Certainly, Athenians would have seen this monument. Yet, as with Theotimos' stele, the Thessalian dedication at Delphi displays no anxiety about the betrayal of Athenians, nor does it try to obscure that the dedication was the result of Thessalian actions at the Battle of Tanagra. Additionally, this is the first mention in the historical record of a Thessalian polemarch, a military office which was well known throughout the Greek world, but lacked attestation in Thessaly prior to this period. What was this position? And why was it highlighted rather than the more well-attested offices of the Tetrarch, Archon, or Basileus? It would be tempting to conclude that the Thessalians were able to publicly promote the betrayal of an extremely powerful ally because the Battle of Tanagra was insignificant. However, this is not the case. After the Battle of Tanagra, the Athenians set up their own monument in Athens. Now this monument did not commemorate Athenian dead, but rather listed the names of all the Argive soldiers who died fighting for the Athenians at Tanagra. This monument, seen here, which unfortunately appears to have been fully fragmented, would have been four feet wide and eight feet tall and erected in the public cemetery in Athens. Like all Greeks, Athenians were extremely jealous of their status as citizens and hesitant to promote the deeds of outsiders. For the Athenians to commemorate the dead of their allies with a monument in an Athenian public space indicates the importance of this battle. It was well known throughout the Greek world. In 454 BCE, three years after the Battle of Tanagra, the Athenians launched an expedition to return the exiled Orestes, son of Thessalian Basileus Echicratidas, to power in Thessaly. Unfortunately, this brief passage from Thucydides is the only extant information we have about the event. Neither Orestes, son of Echicratidas, or Echicratidas himself, appear elsewhere in the historical record. The Athenian expedition to install Orestes went as far as the city of Pharsalus, highlighted there, but was harried by Thessalian cavalry until it was forced to abandon the mission. Thucydides' account does not identify a Thessalian leader, leader nor a Thessalian city that was responsible for this action. This suggests that guerrilla resistance to the Athenian expedition had the backing of the Thessalians as a whole. Furthermore, Pharsalus is, for the Greek world, far from Atrax, home of Theotimos. These cities are understood to have been in different tetrads. Atrax is in Pelasgiotis, 
and Pharsalus is in Thessaliotis, and so theoretically, administratively siloed from one another. Why is this important? Well, if Atrax and Pharsalus are distant from one another in different administrative regions, and Pharsalus was the target of Athenian reprisal after the Battle of Tanagra, then this indicates that the Athenians perceived the responsibility for the Thessalian betrayal at Tanagra was collective rather than limited to one city or one area within Thessaly. This also supports assertions made by Theotimos's gravestone and the dedication at Delphi that the Thessalians as a whole, or at least some form of the majority, supported Thessalian actions at the Battle of Tanagra and the betrayal of the Athenians. Whatever caused the betrayal at Tanagra was not limited to a subsection or subset of Thessalians. So Thessaly disappears from the literary record for the next two decades, but reappears in 431 when Thucydides recorded that the Thessalians sent an expedition to support the Athenian democracy against a Spartan invasion, much like they had 80 years early, earlier to support the Athenian tyrant Hippias. One key element stands out from this account. The expedition is not just composed of the Thessalians, but contingents from individual cities are identified. Not only does Thucydides highlight the fact that the expedition was composed of contingents on a city-by-city -city basis, but there were two different groups from the city of Larissa, each led by different commanders. Moreover, there does not appear to have been a central leader like a Basileus. Instead, the expedition, expedition was likely a coordinated affair whose course was determined by some form of council. Ultimately, Thucydides elected not to elaborate on this situation any further. However, the fact that for the first time, and one of the only instances in extant literary record, the Thessalians were operating as a clear and visible group of individuals. So what should <laughs> modern audiences make of all of this, right? The Thessalian government agreed to a formalized treaty with Athens in 464 to shore up its political support within Thessaly, then betrayed its ally in one of the bloodiest and most important battles of the decade, and then neglected to support their new Spartan allies, and allowed citizens to erect monuments to this betrayal, both inside and outside of Thessaly. And when the Athenians launched a reprisal expedition in 454, the Spartans did nothing to support the Thessalians who helped prevent an Athenian victory? Well, we not, cannot say for certain. I argue that the literary and material evidence points to a political and perhaps social revolution in Thessaly, likely precipitated by the Battle of Tanagra a revolution which is unattested in the extant historical record. Presiding over the end of the Thessalian hegemonic, and hegemonic project in central Greece, made spectacular by the night attack of the Phocians, the Eluad, uh, Eluad dynasty in Larissa had its prestige and ruling mandate undermined. And we see a shattering of elite consensus in Thessaly. When the Persians invaded in 480, the Aluadi saw the opportunity to rec recruit a powerful new ally and reassert their, po reassert their political legitimacy through the destruction of Phocian communal religious sites. Dissident Thessalians attempted to stymie Aluad plans by aligning themselves with the anti-Persian faction of Greeks. The initial de decision to stage the Greek army only a few miles from the Aluad city of Larissa cannot have been an accident. Despite the failure of the second Persian invasion and the expedition of King Leo Tychides, Aluad political authority was not eliminated 
And in 464, the Aluadi saw the opportunity to align themselves with an expansionary Athens in the hope that powerful allies would help tamp down upon on unrest amongst the Tetrads of Thessaly. As part of this alliance, the Aluad dominated government sent a contingent of cavalry to Tanagra in 457 to support Athens against the Spartans. The Aluadi presided over the loss of the Thessalian Empire to focus, backed the losing side of the Persian invasion, and now wanted Thessalian warriors to fight the Spartans, who had just prevented the hated Phocians from expanding. These were the people the Thessalians should fight and die to prevent from going home. It is impossible to know if the Thessalian cavalry planned ahead of time to betray the Athenians, or if this happened organically during the Battle of Tanagra. The fact that, this, this, that the Thessalians ceased participation in the First Peloponnesian War after the battle indicates that the conflict between Athens and Sparta was ultimately of little interest to the Thessalian people. What government would allow its citizens to publicly memorialize undermining foreign policy, both internally through the stele of the Emotimos, or publicly at Delphi, one of the most heavily trafficked sites in Greece? The existence of these monuments in conjunction with the literary record leads me to conclude that the government in Thessaly prior to the Battle of Tanagra was not the same government after the Battle of Tanagra. If Thessaly was racked by revolution against the Aluade in 457, this would explain the lack of further Thessalian involvement in the struggle between Athens and Sparta. It would also give context for the Athenian attempt to install their exiled puppet ruler Orestes in 454, and offers a possibility as to why Orestes had been exiled in the first place. Furthermore, this would explain Thucydides' account of the Thessalian expedition of 431, the Thessalian tetradic government dominated by the Aluade had been overthrown and a government represented or organized along the lines of city or polis had been instituted. <clears throat> so what does this mean for the ancient Greek world? When I began my talk, I mentioned uh, a secret history expressing the unexpressed. And to my mind, this is the most exciting part of the study of the ancient world, examining the blank spaces and finding something new. Lux ex nihilo. The Thessalians betrayed the Athenians at the Battle of Tanagra, not as part of an ideological struggle between Athenian democracy and Spartan oligarchy, but as the result of internal Thessalian political and social dynamics. I believe this to be the case not, only, not because it has been directly attested to, but because events before and after the battle paint a clear picture of a people in, in upheaval, fighting amongst themselves for political control of their country. The glory associated with Themo Timos's death was not simply the glory of war, achieved through the destruction or rout of an enemy. His actions at Tanagra were not the betrayal of Confederates, but the refusal to fight for a frail Aluad government that would indirectly support an ancient enemy. Thessalian treachery at Tanagra was not duplicity, but a violent spasm of a people overthrowing the old political order and building something new. Theotimos died a soldier of the revolution. Thank you all very much. And I'm happy to take questions if anyone asks them, or... Yeah, do you have any questions? <laughs> well, well not everybody at once. Uh, yes, please, Dr. Dickmeyer, thank you so much. Um, so this isn't necessarily about the direct content of the book, but yeah. if Thessaly is not um, particularly involved in the battle of Tanagra, mm -hmm. what is the That's, thank you very much. That's a great question. Well, one of the things that really excited me was the blank spaces, right? And, and you know, most Thessalian history is held together with spit and bailing wire, 
right? You have five different sentences for 45 years, and how do I figure out something to put all these things together, right? And that's, I think, what really excited me, is, is ultimately the kind of conspiracy theory aspect of putting the various pieces together and creating a narrative that would you could understand as as a coherent thing to to interact with the rest of of Greece. I think all too often in in ancient Greece and especially the classical period, we see kind of the grand narrative of the Persian invasion, Athens against Sparta, and then Sparta against Boeotia, and then Alexander the Great, and it's all done, right? And that's, that's kind of like saying the history of the United States is Los Angeles and New York and a little bit of Chicago, right? There's just, there's so much going on elsewhere that interacts, inter influences what's happening with kind of this grand narrative. And that's what really drew me to it. So I apologize, that was a long walk for that, but thank you. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, was dressing up as gods not like a desecration? Like, was it legal or? Uh, it's only a problem if you don't take power. If you do take power, you're good. Um, yeah, I, I, that's a great question, and I, I wish I had a good answer. It really does seem like it, shouldn't it, doesn't it? But apparently it was okay. Well, you said that was in Athens, right? Yes. So he's just, like, dressing as Athena in Athens does seem to add an extra level of... And apparently it was, uh, according to Herodotus says, it was just some Athenian woman he chose like from the countryside because she was very tall, so people would see her more easily. <laughs> like that's, that's as far, yeah. It's, it was a pretty hackneyed plan, but somehow it worked. Thank you. Dr. Yeah, Cesare. I'll give you a, a softball, I hope. Oh, I hope so. Um, so the original Stele itself, you have the picture of that beginning. Yeah. Of Let's see if I can find it. Uh, there we go. Yeah. yeah. Um, in its original context, would these have been painted, do we know? Because there's a pretty big blank space on there. Yeah. It, absolutely. I don't know if there'd be like cool designs on the shield. <laughs> I, I, as far as I am aware, I, I have a limited knowledge of um, sort of that, that area of material evidence. But yeah, it absolutely would have been very brightly painted for everyone to see. Um, and the... Uh, inscription probably would have been painted on as well as directly incised into the uh, into the stele. So while the uh, actual inscription is like at the very top of this thing, probably it would have been painted on on his shield or on the back of the the gravestone. Fabulous question, thank you. Yes, please, Doctor Archer. I have one that you may not know the answer, and I apologize. Not at if all. This is the case. Um, but is there any indication as to whether or not this is supposed to look like the Optimus versus a generic Thessalian soldier? That's a really great question and something this guy got into. So part of the problem with Theotimos' stele is that according to all of the literary accounts of the battle we have, it was only Thessalian cavalry who was there. This guy is clearly not riding a horse, right? So either the literary record is, is wrong, or um, it's very possible, and we know this happens in other areas of ancient Greece, because gravestones are incredibly expensive, it's complex, it takes a lot of time to make, and in the summer in Greece, you don't want to leave a dead body above ground for a long time. We think people bought pre-made uh, gravestones like this and then carved their own inscriptions into them to personalize them. So there's a pretty good chance uh, the family just like bought uh, this off the off the rack, right? And then <laughs> and then inscribed it with their own stuff. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Well, any other questions? I have another question. Okay. Yeah, please. I'm so sorry. No, it's great. Can you go back to the topographic map? Yes. Uh, which one? Not that one. No, okay. <laughs> uh, that one. Whoa. Wait, too far. Yep. Okay, um, so you have the rough journey marked yep. out, and obviously you are wanting to largely avoid going unnecessarily into the mountains. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, but I see that there is a part that does go through Mount something something and Doris. Mount yes. Cowley something something. So, um, is do you have any idea, is it to follow the river right there? Is yeah, it, ab absolutely. So, um, if you're familiar at all 
with uh, kind of Greek history and geography. Um, uh, Thermopylae, the very famous last stand of the Spartans in the Peloponnesian or uh, Persian War, is right here in Epic Numidian Locris, right near the Sperchios Sper River. So probably what happened is, well, we know that at least for overland travel in Greece, river valleys were ideal. Uh, so probably down, down the Sperchios, along the coastal plain, and then cutting in and kind of around along the Cathissos River right there. Um, focus was, as I mentioned, most of the cities and settlements are all uh, along the Cathissos River. And so that was, that was kind of their path. Thank you for asking, it's a great question. Yes, please. Just kind of a, j curious. Yes. Have you gotten any pushback from other scholars from kind of the time period that that you're in that are like, why would you talk about this or or disagree with your time? That's a great question. Luckily, um, there are not many folks who really do Thessalian <laughs> history. Like, for example, the big books in the field, uh, one was written in 1935, the other one was written by uh, an Italian woman in the 1950s. They're both great books, but um, the vast, it's not, there's really not a whole lot of people who do this sort of stuff. Um, I think there are certainly some areas where my methodology could be critiqued, and that's totally fair. Um, but you know, I think in terms of a, a narrative, this is ultimately the only one that really makes sense. It's, it's, a, lot, it's a lot of circumstantial evidence, but for me at least, I don't see any, any other alternatives. Thank you for asking. Well, thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate all of you being here. Um, I'll hang around if you have any other questions. Otherwise, thank you again for the, to the Department of History for putting this on and Dr. Archer and yeah, have a great evening. Thank you.